Right, guys, we are live. We are here with the future of football. I'm joined today by the one and only Jill Ellis Thanks, and Mr. Arsene Wenger. We're here discussing, with a, a nice little crowd here we've got gathered, um, we're discussing the future of football, as I said. And how do we get here? Probably the first question that a lot of people are asking is, is I saw all of the stuff in the media that came out, all on social media, the confusion with the fans. What does this mean? Does it mean there's more money here? There's more games? A lot of panic. Um, and as I said before, confusion. Um, and that's why I kind of reached out to, to Arsene and, and asked, would you like to come on, on five? Would you like to have a chat about it? Just to kind of add some clarity to the whole discussion. And I think that confusion leads to fear. Um, and I think in football, you, you, you don't want that. And I think historically, football has always had a problem and been reluctant um, to have any change. Um, so... We understand that, and so I think the more that we give clarity, the more we speak about it and give people the, the idea as, as of what's going on, the better. So how do we get here? How do we get to this point where everyone's saying football needs to change? Well, first of all, uh, maybe I give uh, the <laughs> word to Jill. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, I think just, you know, having been in this game for a long time, I mean, I think change is a part of football. I think people tend to forget that, you know, rules have changed. We've introduced technology. Like, we're constantly looking at this refinement process of how do we make the game better. So I think that's almost the starting point is how do we continue to improve the game? I think that was where we, we kind of started from this. And, you know, I think for speaking specifically for the women's game is we want to continue to grow and evolve our game. We've already created a, a, a good sized footprint but how do we elevate that? How do we bring the sport to more people? How do we get more kids playing? Um, and looking at different structures and how we can pull levers to, to kind of accelerate our sport. So I think ultimately, I think as a coach um, and probably as a player, you recognize if you stand still, you'll get passed by. So we've got to continually look at different processes and ways to grow our sport. Just before we start as well, just to let the, the fans understand is that there's a confusion around you guys and FIFA are making a decision. Can you just clear that up, that point, please? Well, for we do not make the decision. It's the 211 countries belonging to FIFA who make the decisions. But as well, what is important for people to know is the international match calendar defines the number of games the national team plays and the number of games the club football is played. And at the moment, it's during the season, 80% club football, 20% national team football. This calendar ends in 2024. What we are talking about is what happens after 2024. Do we continue like it is now or do we change something? So am I right, we, we, we spoke earlier in the green room that the football world has shown that there aren't, they aren't happy with the way it stands at the moment, the football calendar. And that's why, again, we're, we're talking about changing the calendar. That's why we are talking about that. We consulted uh, out of 100 football people, 99% want changes, you know, because uh, there's too many frictions between club football and national team football. And now we have interruptions at every interruption. We have problems for the national team coaches and for the club coaches. They don't want to release the players. Uh, the national team has not enough uh, uh, players to play like they want. They have not enough time to practice with the players as well because they go on Sunday, on Thursday they play, they cannot work. Mm -hmm. So we think, uh, we have spoken a lot about that, that in the future a better separation between national team football and club football would benefit the game. And as well, uh, one of the questions we might talk about later is reduce the number of qualifiers and play more tournaments at the end of the season. That's uh, with a more modern separation between national team and club. So while we're on that point, why don't we, do, we should just address it straight away. So you're looking at maybe having two blocks in the, in the calendar that are for qualifiers, yeah. as opposed to having four... Five. Five books that we have At now. the moment, the players go September, October, November, March, and June. You know, what I propose, and uh, honestly, I only propose <laughs> and don't decide. Uh, it's important that uh, it's football world who will decide that. I propose a clear separation between uh, playing two blocks of qualifiers only. Why? Because I think the evolution is like that. 
people want quality. And uh, when I was a kid, the friendly games were important. They're not important anymore. Mm. I think now the qualifiers are not important anymore or less important. Why? Because in Europe, they will go to 32 countries out of 55. Mm. You will play for one and a half year to qualify 32 teams out of 55. I think that's a key point because I think a lot of people you know, on social media when we've looked at it and you see a lot of the responses coming in when I put loads of questions out on social media, a lot of it was like, I'm actually bored of the friendlies or I'm bored of the qualifiers now. There's a lot of dead games and you're saying this would maybe clear that element up? It would reduce this number of games mm -hmm. and clear it up. That means uh, in, uh, Ju in October and March you will have uh, the teams who qualify for June, you know, mm. for the final tournament. After is it a World Cup or something else? I don't don't know. But I think it's important for the future of the game that uh, we protect the national team football, and as well that uh, we reduce the number of qualifiers. Mm. And just to jump in here, because on the women's side is. You know, and it can't be a one-size-fits-all. I mean, for women's football, the national team is still a massive driver of development. I was going to ask you that, the differences yeah, between the Yeah, because, you know, so men. many countries in the world don't have infrastructure. They don't have domestic leagues, which ultimately is kind of becomes the lifeblood. So for many, you know, I'd say for most countries in the world, having regular touch points with a national team actually keeps women's football alive within the country because the, the national team drives it because they don't have a domestic league. And so for us, it's looking, but I would agree, you know, we have a, we have a calendar right now that has a September, October and November rhythm, which is hard for clubs and it's hard for national team coaches to bring them in. So also on the women's side, we're, we're looking at the calendar and saying, we probably don't limit drastically the number of national team touch points. So our windows potentially we're looking at five because we still recognize and acknowledge that we don't have the same kind of infrastructure that we have all around the world for, for leagues. So it's it's a slightly different, but... So, so in the women's game yep. and, the, and the women's World Cup, it, the benefits are for you for having it every two years would be like definite exposure, more investment, which obviously then you can deploy that money throughout the, the pyramid of the, of the women's game and the uptake in terms of participation grows. Is that what? Yeah, I mean, it's just, amount? you know, if, if you look statistically and look at revenue and investment and fans and all the things right now, the biggest lever we can pull in the women's game is the World Cup. It's the highest profile event we have. Mm. And so if we really want this thing to have a much bigger footprint, you know, what I'm saying is that not, let's not just look at a five-year pr proposal. Let's look at 30 years. Where do we want our sport to be? Because it can be already we know there's an appetite for it. It's growing drastically. But, you know, potentially looking at the biennial. And then, again, to Arson's point, this isn't our decision. This is us researching and looking and discussing um, it could be the biggest way we can accelerate our sport by looking at having a World Cup every two years. And certainly then you have to look in, it makes sense, but then how do you implement that? Another key, or another kind of, one of the most talked about things on social media was, isn't it just about money? I mean, lots of fans are saying it's about greed, money, more finances for FIFA. Um, what would be your take on that? Well, I think for us, you know, the... Again, the money that comes in, I mean, we're still, it goes back out. Like, you know, I think there's so much more transparency. I think, I think people that have, you know, that, that cynicism about it is probably based on the history or the past, right? Now we have to look at, you know, the, you know, I, I, I'm not a, a FIFA person, but in terms of the, the financials, there's full disclosure and transparency. You can go online and you look at how they spend the money. So all the money that comes in from the tournaments, it's all transparent. You can see that online and where it gets deployed to. Yeah, you can look. I mean, okay. there's grants offered. There's all kinds of things. But so I think for women's football, the, you know, generating more money actually goes back and helps develop and grow the game. Um, so for us, you know, even having, you know, a biennial tournament for, for the men as well, we're looking at how do we, how do we constantly grow our game? And, and certainly we need resources and finances to do that. I, I've been guided, Rio, you know, well, con you know well the problems in the game. I've been guided by uh, just how can we make football better in the world. Mm. In Europe, it's all well. But uh, the guy who, who is in Africa, he on Saturday, he has only one choice, is to watch the Premier League, you know. Mm. In his country, nothing happens. So because there's no league, no competitive league, they have the right as well to develop the game and as well uh, to give every talent a chance in the world. That is our target. For that, we have three possibilities. One is improve the education of the youth. Because we know that the senior level, if the youth is a good education, they have a chance to, to do well. 
The second thing is the competitions. How do you know you played football at the top level? How do you know that you're good when you can compete with people who are good? Mm -hmm. So to give access to countries who have more chances to compete is the second way to improve football. The third level is uh, to improve the rules of the game. But uh, we here we speak about the competitive level and to give more opportunities to countries to have access to better competition will incite them to do something for their youth programs. And uh, yesterday we launched the Academy Online to help all the countries. We went into 205 countries to study what is their problem. And we realized that in Europe, of course, we, have, we can play under 10, under 12, under 15. That doesn't happen in the rest of the world. Mm. And we have to do something about it. So we developed the academies, but as well, they need to have a taste to say, oh, we can play maybe uh, in higher competitions. And we have to do something about it. Is, 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 sorry to cut is, is that Are you saying that when there's World Cups around that, you see more uptake in the men's game as well? You see more children influenced? You see more children in influence, and you see it's, it's today the only event that creates a unity in a country mm. where everybody's proud to be part of his country. It doesn't exist anymore in anything else, you know. Religion has disappeared, war, war has disappeared, we united the countries as well, mm. and hopefully it will last for a long, long time. But sport, is the, sport has become important in the society, and we have Today, I feel, I, I can understand the opposition to that, but I feel that we are scared to have too much exposure. We should be proud of that. We want people to watch football. We want people to participate in the game. And uh, I, I feel uh, during my life, football has always become more important, and I'm very happy with it. You know? mm. And I want it to be even more important. And football, as well as a responsibility today, is to educate the world. That's the best way we have to do it. Mm. And we have to try to develop it even more. I 100% agree with you in, in, in that the more exposure the game gets, that we want to see great, good, entertaining football. We're all the same. Or football lovers love, want that. But then when you speak to current players who are playing mm. and you talk about this change that there could be in the calendar, a lot of the players, the first question is, or pushback is, more games, too many games. Is that, is that a fact or is that, is that going to be something that's going to be looked at? Because yeah. the players don't need more games, surely. Well, to, to give you sort of an example, again, I think it's slightly different on the women's side. I mean, the women average, you know, European player in, in Europe averages probably 25 less games than the men's side. Wow. So, you know, it, it, from that, I think we have to look at it differently. You know, we're, you, you know, we've done a lot of studies and looked at, you know, two players from a same national team, same country and, and same domestic league, you know, in France. And there's actually 25 to 30 sometimes is the difference. Um, so I think from our perspective, it's looking as, you know, is there a right number? Um, you know, I think we've had this, Ars and I have had this conversation is, is there any magic number to the number of games that a player could play? Honestly, ultimately it comes down to probably the individual, what you're capable of and your capacity. Um, what we do know about the game is we've got, you know, better sports science, better, uh, you know, rules and regulations and obviously technology to protect the players with VAR, et cetera, et cetera. So there are more measures, but certainly as we look at this, we have to put the player at the middle of it. It has to be player centric. So I think what we're actually looking and exploring now is what, what is that target range for players mm -hmm. um, in terms of numbers? Because the reality is for us, you know, pl players averaging 12 to 13 national team matches. So again, the, the bulk of their games are not coming from, from national team, it's, it's coming from club. Uh, are you consulting the players and the managers in this process as well? We try. What do you mean? <laughs> we face some opposition sometimes, uh, especially in some countries, even in England, you know, I tried to speak to Harry Kane I, and uh, he was busy with the national team, we couldn't, but we speak to many people. I think that might have been due to you being a former Arsenal manager. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no, but uh, what I want to say first of all is our programme is that uh, we do not, with what we propose, you don't play more games. Okay. You know? And uh, secondly, uh, we consult everybody. And on, on top of that, I want to say, as I managed for 40 years, I had problems with the players who did not play, never with the players who played. You know? uh, so 
I would say, uh, I feel sorry for the players who don't play. For the players who play, let's not go overboard. There is a number, you know. Uh, the players want to play big games. Rio, you have played for 18 years at the top level, it didn't kill you. Mm. You look in the perfect shape today. Okay. You know? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, so I, I don't feel sorry for too much f f for players who play football. I, I believe what is important, uh, I feel more sorry for the players who don't play. Mm. And I had uh, problems in my life with the players who didn't play. I think a guy who plays football, He's a happy boy. So, so you said something quite interesting in, in the green room earlier about, you said to me, Rio, would you rather play Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, or Saturday, no game midweek, and play Saturday? When I look back in my career, I wanted to play, I wanted to bounce the games out because the rhythm, momentum, the mental met because you prefer to play than to practice. Train, yeah. you know. <laughs> that's a key point. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so uh, that's uh, to ask any player in the world, do you want to play three games in a week or do you want to have a whole week of hard training? You say, no, no, let, uh, let, let me play on <laughs> Wednesday, you know. So that's, that's as well, you get a little bit confused. There is, there is what, what I want to add to that is we have a mandatory rest period. Uh, oh, okay after the tournament of 25 days, every club has to give 25 days rest. But this nearly, we can even discuss about that, can go 26, 27, we have room enough to do it, and that the place has a complete rest to regenerate. It's more mental, you know that. Mm. It's not physically today, the players are prepared, looked after, every scientist overprotects the players now, you know. I was gonna go into that, do you feel the players nowadays uh, have too much information, too much cuddles, too yes. much information. <laughs> yes. Yes? Yes. Okay, why, well, can you like No, because, because uh, this, this, uh, you employ now a battery of scientists to, who help you to understand better the player and the world you live in, but as well, they are overprotective because they never want to say, oh, you told me he can play, you know? Mm. And as well, because above the science is the knowledge and the experience of the manager. Because, for example, a, a guy comes in and said uh, the day before the game, this player didn't run at all today. But when you know the player, you know he has a game in mind tomorrow. Everybody prepares differently. Mm -hmm. Some want to work hard the day before. Some don't want to work at all the day before. So you have to let them mm -hmm. uh, prepare like they want to prepare. And that is not... So the knowledge of the manager has to be above the, the information of the science. And... Uh, so sometimes uh, the fact that you have too many data, you become overprotective. Protect How would you have managed today? Like, with all, with all considering all you just said, and you went into a change room, say you, when you came into management at Arsenal, you had big characters, leaders, winners, mm -hmm. Tony Adams, Steve Bold, Mike Keown, Seaman, etc. They weren't overprotective. Um, no. Cuddled. No. At all. No, I would say the, sci uh, the science has helped a lot to know better many things that we ignored before. But as well, uh, the evolution of the game, you know, we have uh, is that from these generations, you know, the, there were men who came to the game and made their career through their mental strengths. Because they were playing first at Stoke, they had to fight like mad every week to show that they have the quality. And uh, we have gone today to early detection at 12, 13 years already, the cl big clubs select the players and overprotect them. Mm -hmm. And maybe we have to encourage again to get these clubs to forge the character of the players in a society that has become a bit too more, pro more protective and uh, find a better balance, develop the initiative, forge the character of the players. Accountability, reliability is maybe the challenge of the modern e education. Mm. I like that. <laughs> um, I think on that note, we'll have to go to some of the fans. Obviously, before we came on, we, we asked some of the fans on social media to throw in some questions. So we've got a question here from um, at nandu.ready7. That's a real name. Um, what are the advice? Well, I think I already touched upon it. I think for the women, it would be just another accelerator of our sport. You know, it's just 
we want to um, to grow it. And I think, that, you know, part of what we also have to look at in our in the women's sport is making sure that we're not just growing the top end. I think that's one of the challenges. We've seen it right recently in, in Women's World Cup qualifiers, these lopsided scores, you know, 10-0, et cetera. So I think the challenge for us is, you know, can we, can we accelerate the game, but can we also bring the developing countries along? So we have truly a global game on the women's side. But I think for the women's game, you know, just the, the profile of the World Cup every single time, you know, 99 to oh, 15 to 19, we've seen our viewership. I mean, there was over a billion viewers that watched the last Women's World wow. Cup. Um, you know, sponsors are jumping on board. Players, players' careers are launched. They're getting contracts. Like, there's so many big benefits from the spotlight that the World Cup brings. Um, I think it, you know, it's just definitely something we have to explore. And, you know, it's something that I think can really help our game. What's been the feedback, actually, interestingly, from from the women who played the game? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's it's mixed. I mean, we what we've done on the women's side is we have formed a, an advisory group, and we've got you know former players, current players, we've got coaches, a national team club, sports scientists, and referees. We've kind of brought this group together. Um, just to really get some initial feedback and then you know um, you know I've had one one player plays for the US team who said I play in a World Cup every year you know because it's to, to Arson's point it's the idea of we want to play big games um, but you know and, and certainly some players I think I think one of the things we have to get past is just this idea of the tradition of a World Cup every four years mm. I was there a few years ago I'm like oh no the World Cup's every four years and then this guy you know I call him Yoda smart guy <laughs> um, you know he said it's not it's not about the frequency of a World Cup is it's how how special the event it is you know we have a Champions League every single year the men and the women it doesn't diminish how good it is because it's every year it's because it's quality and so I think you know that those thoughts kind of you know a few years ago I started to really look into this and I think the other thing that's been really good for me is again I've only looked through my lens as a former US coach with all the resources in the world how do we help all these other countries how do we help um, you know these developing countries find their place and grow their game because I was I grew up many many years ago in this country and I never had the chance to play women's football and now I look at where it is in this country and I think that's with investment that's with exposure that's with growth so let's try and share that with the rest of the world so everybody else can have that chance do, do you think we're ready now because of the the way that people consume entertainment content football especially and that we're ready to make it every two years and and the other point to that is and a lot of people mention this as well if it does go to two years does that mean that it's less prestigious yes prestigious like the grand the grandness of the actual tournament oh, goes? Yeah. we don't know because we have not studied that on the financial point of view what is a reproach that fifa gets many times but i would say uh, jill gave a perfect answer that is suitable for men as well but uh, what I'm quite surprised is uh, in a society that is anti-discriminative, you ask anybody in the street, you think a World Cup for women is good every two years? He says, yes, yes, fantastic. Why? It will develop women's game. But why is it bad for men then? <laughs> you know, <laughs> True, it's, yeah. qui it's quite, uh, why does it not develop uh, the quality of men's game? So mm. it is, uh, for me, exactly that shows that the reluctance is basically emotional because you have all, all grown up in that cycle of four years. Tradition. Yep. Tradition, you know, and uh, we want to keep it as it is. And uh, the younger generation, we see as well the split in our sports that uh, the younger generations is in favor. The generation over 50 is against. Is that know? a fact, yeah? Yeah. That wow. is a fact in the, in the study that we have, is the, there is a split in the, in the way people see the evolution. That means, you know, there is a good example. This year we had the European Championship. It was a fantastic in England, a, a fantastic event in England. We had the Nations League mm -hmm. in, in Italy, was well attended again. We have next year the World Cup, everybody looks forward to it. And nobody uh, says, no, uh, we do not want the World Cup next year because mm -hmm. we're the Euro this year. Everybody is in favor of it. So we don't have to be scared of uh, what is the modern, the modern guy who watches football is knowledgeable, he's demanding, he tests the quality of what he watches, he goes, watches, if it's not good enough, he moves away. So let's, that means there is a demand for quality in the generations because people today are knowledgeable and informed and they know they can judge 
they have the quality of assessment and judgment. So what are we? We have the responsibility to give them top quality. That's what we propose after, as Elijah said, we don't decide. It's only our proposal. Mm. Oh, good. And this leads me to this next point from, um, we've got it from uh, Baris Bali, which is at Baris Bali 3. Does the domestic or European club schedule need to be less demanding to make the biennial FIFA World Cups more feasible? The domestic club schedule? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, we're kind of like we look at the percentages. I mean, in the women's game, you know, they're playing 43 uh, club games and 12, you know. So y if you look at, you know, the question of are we playing too much? I mean, I think 12 to 13 national team games a year is, you know, again, think about the rest of the world, the importance mm. of developing. I think that's a decent number. I think we have to look at. You know, I know, for example, in England, there's, there's FA Cup, Conti Cup. There's, there's a lot of different championships. And again, I, I think we're in, a, we're in a different space in terms of volume. I think we've got to really look at what makes sense for the women's game. Um, but I think my goal, and you know, I look at, for example, Italy. You know, after the World Cup 2019, Italy's team had such a good run that there was such a wave and an energy that it, it's actually helped accelerate their club league. Like that's the bounce we get from a World Cup. Mm -hmm. it, it actually helps, it's almost like a launch pad for us in terms of growing things. So I think for us, you know, it's, it's looking at how they can work in harmony. Um, I think we have to have harmony between the men and the women's calendar. You know, Arsene and I have talked about that. We can't have, as we did in 2019, the men's Conmebol final uh, at the same, the same very day as the women's world championship final. Um, we've got to make sure that doesn't happen. Although, just to be fair, the women outdrew the men in terms of viewership Audience. in Brazil, by the way. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that we just um, we just have to look at the calendars and look at what makes sense. But I think, you know, a domestic league is very, very important. And we have to try and grow that in, in more countries for us. I believe as well that, uh, you know, the, the national team, uh, at the moment, 80-20, we have to keep that balance, right? And we have as well to be careful about the evolution of a game because when you're responsible, you have to anticipate what will football tomorrow be. And uh, what is a, a club football today, and I love club football, is but the owners are international people, billionaires who are from all over the world. What is national team is still the only place where the sovereignty of a country is protected. Mm -hmm. Nobody owns the English national team. Mm -hmm. So. It's important that uh, we find for the future a good balance between worldwide football and national team football, you know. And uh, I think the top competitions, international competitions, are a way to protect the, nat the national team football. Good. So I've got another question about sustainability because that's been a big topic as well. Um, do you want to put in an arson there because he's more informed? <laughs> this is um, from at underscore Moses underscore Lee underscore. Um, do you think regarding the state of the climate that football should be making this move, causing more travel more frequently uh, or should football be setting an example instead of trying to gain more financial benefits and players will get ruined physically? So forget the last bit. I think we've discussed that. I think it's more about sustainability and the climate change. Yeah, the climate change, of course, is a worry for everybody. Uh, we live in a society where people travel a lot anyway. And uh, the only thing we are studying our numbers, approximately 30% at the World Cup of people are local, you know, and 70% uh, of people come in and out. Uh, FIFA is worried and concerned about that and has made a, a proposal to be climate clean in 2040. How will we do it? I don't know. I will not be here anymore in 2040, so I will not have to justify that. But uh, of course, it's a concern. And uh, uh, anyway, I would say we have made as well this proposal to reduce the traveling. Mm. For example, up to now, a player who plays from South America in Europe, per year, he makes 80,000 kilometers flight. What we propose, we divide by two, just by reducing the number of qualifiers and by regrouping the qualifiers. You know, it do doesn't come in September, October, November. All the players fly away now. Mm -hmm. Everybody plays in Europe. So we reduce already by half the distances uh, that the players make. Mm -hmm. It will be maybe a bit more in, uh, 
uh, with a big tournament. But anyway, the players will play uh, national team football. You call that World Cup or you call that uh, uh, Nations or Confederations Cup. They will play in the national team. Mm. Another question from uh, Aniru DHMP007. Good name. Um, 007. <laughs> <laughs> you could be the next yeah, 007. Uh, Come on. Uh, I'll, I'll turn it down twice. I don't <laughs> want to go again. Um, but how will this decision um, with the new calendar help the, the lower ranked teams and the underdeveloped countries as well? How is that actually going to help them? I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, but just a bit more detail for some of the people that are writing in. I mean, I Part of it is, again, talking about just the balance. I mean, if you have a World Cup more frequently, more people get to host. And always, and, and then we can look at having it on more continents, you know, more frequently. I think that's part of what you're looking at is, you know, Asia and Africa and Europe. I mean, now the rotation, North America, um, Central America, South America, the rotation, if it's more frequent, those countries get the, the visibility, the profile. And, and ultimately, you know, I remember after Germany hosted the World Cup in 11, the, the number of participation of kids just accelerated. The same happened in Canada. So I think that can in and of itself by just hosting a World Cup can help develop the game and, and promote the game. Um, and I think, you know, it, it gives more opportunity. And in terms of the developing countries too, it's also looking if you're starting to restructure perhaps qualifying is what other things can we do? The, to, to give an example, there was a, a CONMEBOL country, um, I'm not going to mention it, but they only activate for World Cup qualifiers. Then the women's program deactivates for almost 600 days, 900 days. And so if we have a more frequent World Cup, programs stay activated more because federations want to have their teams participate they want to create you know go into qualifiers and it keeps the the women's football front and center because there's a little more regular rhythm if that makes mm -hmm. sense whereas before it's four years dormant four years and now we can have potentially a more a, be a better rhythm so i think there's a lot of reasons as to why this could help the, the countries that are continuing to evolve and grow the game and develop. I mean, right now we don't have 10, 211 member associations active on the women's side. I think we're sitting 150, 160. Well, okay. we want all the countries that are in this, uh, yeah, want to try and grow their programs. So, Look, uh, as well, we have to, first of all, we have more frequency, like Jill explained very well, give more incentive and more hope. But as well, we have to educate uh, these countries, you know. Africa is today uh, 1.2 billion. In 20 years, it will be 2.5 billion. We have to give these people a chance to develop for the game. Asia is 4 billion. Europe is 500 million. Mm -hmm. And everybody plays in Europe. We have to give a chance to all these countries to develop. Do you, do you, do you feel resistance or ignorance might be a better word? from the European side when, you, when you're talking about developing in, in the underdeveloped worlds or countries, sorry. <laughs> I mean, listen, I think the, you know, there is, I mean, certainly, you know, if you look at the last uh, World Cup, the last, out uh, the last eight teams, seven were European. Um, and so certainly there's, there's creating more and more separation on the women's game as Europe, you know, gets, but, but this is the other thing and the point I've made is, that we have to, as, as a sport, as women's football, what we also have to look to is how can we sustain ourselves? Still, we're heavily reliant on men's football. Uh, you know, does a, does a Man City women's club exist without a Man City football men's side, right? Like, there's a lot of funding that's getting funneled into that. And at some point, yes, that's great to help us start, but we want to grow our model so that we don't that's need right. that su mm -hmm. su support. Uh, support. So, I, you know, I think for us, um, it's even in Europe, which is probably the most developed in terms of the number of domestic leagues within Europe, we're still so reliant on, on men's football for the financing piece. So I think we've got to continue to look at ways that we can grow our game. I think that's really important. Let me just take you back to when you were both managers or and with, the, with that mindset. And we talk about the calendar and having more time with the national team in blocks mm -hmm. in the calendar. That's the proposal. If you take it back to when you, if you're the club manager in that period of time, would you be panicked? Would you be like, what do I do? What would be, the, what would be your take on that situation once you get that time in the calendar at the club? Personally, in my proposal, uh, I took the club into consideration because I know well the problems of the clubs, and I was uh, scared every time the players moved away. You know, you had uh, 15 international players. 
in what state they come back because the players come back on Thursday. When they play on Wednesday night in South America, it's Thursday morning here. Mm. You play on Saturday a big game. When they come back, you don't know, can we play them or not? Do I play him or not? Do I play him one half or not at all? Because on Tuesday you have a Champions League game. Mm. So you know it's an impossible way to deal with the situation. So I, that's why I propose a better separation and the club's interest is protected and the national team would have a better uh, periods where they can work with the players. What do the national team coaches complain today? We cannot train, we cannot practice. And what do the coaches, the club football uh, club managers say? Our players go too many times away, we cannot work with them. And in England, you play in a big club, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, break, the players go away. They come back, you play against, you know, mm. you cannot work. Mm. But what did you used to say to the players when they used to go away? Because I, I remember Sadek's place used to I say, told you them, don't play more than Be careful, minutes. you know who we play when you come back and uh, as well, uh, don't play the first game, you have a hamstring problem, you know. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> tell the coach, or I will call him to... T to uh, the national team coach plays a big game, he plays his best players, you know. And uh, when Thierry Henry went away with a little knock at the knee, he still played for the national team because they, were, they, they want to do it and uh, they're under pressure as well to do it. Mm. What you can understand, that's why I would say all these frictions would disappear with a better separation. How much problems did you have with like the the England managers or the France managers, the, the managers of your, of your players? Well, uh, first of all, uh, sometimes your understanding, your connections were better. With others, they were not fantastic. With others, you had no communication at all because some people refused to communicate because they wanted wow. to. So it was different, you know, but uh, overall, you had frictions, but uh, sometimes uh, I didn't even know the guy from Chile. <laughs> but he played Sanchez every time. Mm. <laughs> so uh, uh, you could not even communicate. Mm. Yourself in the women's game? Well, I think when, when I was a, obviously the national team coach, it was uh, to not have that player p feel that push-pull. You know, what we tried to do was really go out and... You know, every year I'd bring all the club managers in and have a meeting and, and discuss and talk and talk about our players, not your player, my player. I mean, I think, you know, part of that is um, you've got to create that uh, that relationship so you can. So, so listen, if there's a big game, am I going to be conscious that they have a game the following weekend or in so many days? And I look at minutes and all those things. Yeah. I mean, um, but I think, it, you know, it's the cooperation that I get for a lot of teams doesn't exist. But for me, it was a priority to to work in, in good harmony with the clubs. And, you know, I've even had club coaches, they play their player as a, as a 10, and for us, she's the left back, you know, but you, but when they're with their clubs, it's like you've got to honor and respect the fact that that's where they are and they need to be focused on that. So, you know, I never, never really talked to the players when they were with their clubs because it was all about what they needed to do for that manager. So are there, are there any other points that you'd like to touch on before we, we, we round up? So I know that obviously there's been a lot of questions asked, a lot of confusion. Um, yep. around the calendar. Have you got everything you need to get off your chest, guys? No, what I would say, uh, we are open to ideas, you know. Uh, we do not think uh, that we know exactly uh, what is right and what is wrong. We uh, ask anybody uh, with suggestions and uh, what uh, we were guided by making football better, give more clarity, more simplicity, because I think when you're responsible in football, it's important that uh, Anybody you ask in the street who loves football understand what's going on mm. and it's clear. So we wanted to keep simplicity and uh, make it a bit more modern and more functionable. But of course, the basic idea is to make football better all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, similar. I mean, I think it's almost like where we started, you know, at the end of the day, we've got to continue to evolve our sport. I think the women's trajectory is is different than the men's. And that's why I think we have really zeroed in to what makes sense for us. Um, and, you know, to the point, I think we've it's about listening, um, getting feedback. It's a cycle, right? You listen, you're, you're refining and then discussing. Um, but ultimately, I think, you know, all the shareholders uh, want to have a voice and want to have um, you know, their viewpoint heard. And I think that's part of the process that we're going through. 
Uh, again, ultimately, it's not going to be, you know, our decision. But I think what we're trying to do is facilitate the conversation and also facilitate the viewpoints. It's important to me that that people, you know, in Europe understand that there's other opinions and viewpoints out of there that also have to be considered when you're talking about global football. Right, and just to soften the mood before we leave, I've just got one question I wanted to ask both of you. I'll start with yourself. Okay. You are my favourite player. There we go. <laughs> you've got your, your £10 no, on your lead. Object. <laughs> no, I actually want to know... Man, man, you fan. Come I want to know who your favourite player was when you was coaching, the, the best player to coach. Oh, that's like picking your kid. But, but I can go there now because I'm not the kid. I mean, listen, I had this player... Um, I had a, a lot of amazing players. I mean, Abby Wambach is an iconic player, was such a selfless player, one of the best leaders I've ever been around. But then another player I had, you know, it didn't matter what team we were playing or whether we were at training, always showed up with the same level of intensity. That's, you know, consistency of a player is something I have so much admiration for. Never cut corners. Didn't matter if we were in a training session, we are playing a World Cup final or we are playing, you know, local friendly. It was just this same level of commitment and intensity, and that was uh, Julie Ertz. Good, good. Awesome. Yeah. Rio Ferdinand. <laughs> <laughs> you got to give me one name or two or three names. I don't names. give you one name because it's like Gilles said, you know, we, yeah. are, we, are, we are do not, uh, when you're a coach, you do not necessarily admire the most talented. Yeah. We admire sometimes the most reliable, the guy who never disappoints you. Yeah. So you have so many players. And as well, we are in a little bit in a position of parent. Mm. You do not want it's to single true. out true. somebody when you, you love them all with the same, yeah. with a distance, with the same love. You, you should know. be a, um, an MP. You should be <laughs> a, a, a <laughs> diplomat. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, give me, well, give me a player. I just, I, I've got to get a name out of you. Just you know, the most talented players are, of course, the Burkham, Thierry Henry, and uh, these guys who score goals and make you dream to be a, a top-class football player. But you admire as well the right back. Yep. Who every Saturday, you know, he Lee Dixon. Keep, absolutely. <laughs> Lee Dixon, for example, I admire him, of course. And uh, these generations, you know, were maybe less skillful, less talented, because it was a uh, revolution of a game has become more, more technical, but they were accountable, you know. Mm. And when, when you're manager, you respect that. You know, you, your job is on the line, and uh, you know that at least what you want from your players is that they give you exactly what they have every time. This, this generations were not educated to practice uh, with 100% concentration. They were educated to turn up on Saturday. You know? <laughs> and uh, sometimes I was sitting at home thinking, I don't play him, he had a poor week in training. <laughs> on Saturday, he surprised Screw me always. Yeah. Wow. He turned up uh, with top level performance. Wow. So that's what you love. Mm -hmm. So in to, in just to, to finish on that point, so today's generation, you see them, they're, they're, because of the system, they've been given so many tools to do well, they're enab it enables them to be less accountable. I, I would say uh, you, you, the society today is more protective and uh, initiative in the game is very important because you have to make quick decisions in, uh, in, in a very, a very, very uh, high intensity. So to educate, get maybe a better balance to educate them to take more initiative individually, because you can overcoach as well. Mm. And at the end of the day, uh, it is important that uh, you put the players, you educate the players to make their own decision, not that you make that the decision in their place. You know? mm. Well, that's yeah. a good way to finish. It is, isn't it? Brilliant. I appreciate your time, guys. Listen, the future of football is what we've spoken about today. I hope we've cleared up a lot of the questions that you guys had. All the questions you sent in, thank you very much. Thank you to the audience who came and uh, had the pleasure of listening to these two very insightful people. Listen, thanks again. Thank and um, again, just to reiterate, this is just a proposal that's been put forward. This isn't a decision. These guys aren't here making a decision. FIFA aren't making a decision. They're putting it out there, seeing the feedback. And then there's going to be a big vote with the stakeholders of, of, uh, of the game. So, again, thank you very much for your time, and uh, we'll catch up soon. Bye-bye.